Welcome to our first panel session, Exploring Citizen Science. So um, we're going to hear from three speakers who work in this field. Um, we're going to be looking at um, the landscape of citizen science and participatory research approaches, um, how they used, um, how good practice is thought about, and also how citizen science can be best supported and embedded. Um, we're going to hear from um, some UK perspectives, but also some international perspectives as well. Um, so the format, um, just to let you know, I'm going to introduce all three speakers um, and then invite them to speak for about 10 minutes <clears throat> each, excuse me, and then we'll have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm just losing my voice. Um, so uh, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Helena Hollis, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Community Studies. Um, and um, works on a range of projects there. Helena works with us supporting our, um, some of our citizen science projects as well. Um, some of the examples of Helena's research at the um, Institute includes working on making research opportunities inclusive and accessible to different communities and um, research on how social infrastructure is understood and how it can be equitably developed both in the UK and internationally. Um, we are next going to hear from Dr. Christian Reynolds, um, who is a senior lecturer at the Centre for Food Policy at City University London. Christian is recognised as a, a, an expert across the world on food loss and waste and sustainable diets. Um, Christian's worked on these issues, um, as I say, right across the world in um, Australia, um, New Zealand, Indonesia and Europe, um, as well as the US. Um, Christian is, um, has a really keen interest in citizen science for the food system and was lead on the author of the Food Standard Agency's um, 2021 Citizen Science and Food Report. Um, and lastly, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Margaret Gold, who is the citizen science lead with the um, Open Science Programme at Leiden University and coordinator of the Citizen Science Lab, which is a project incubator and knowledge hub that brings together scientists, policymakers, citizens and other stakeholders in participatory research projects and tackles urgent um, societal issues. Um, Margaret's also the Citizen Science Programme Manager for the National Programme Open Science um, and uh, she's contributing to the development of a national strategy for open science um, and the establishment of Citizen Science Netherlands, the Dutch national network for citizen science practitioners. Um, so I'm going to um, first up invite uh, Helena to speak and Helena you're going to share your own slides I believe. I'm Helena, I work at the Institute for Community Studies. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we are a research institute. We are part of the Young Foundation, which is a charity. And as its research arm, I suppose, we're hoping to influence change. And as you can see, our strap line here says that we're interested in bridging the gap between communities, evidence, and policymaking. Um, so I think citizen science is a really powerful way um, to attempt to bridge that gap. Um, so we at the Institute have been working with UKRI um, on their citizen science funded projects. Uh, so as Jen mentioned, that has included supporting a current group of projects under the kind of collaboration grant scheme. You saw a couple in the videos and you'll hopefully see some later again. Um, and there I think our primary kind of interest is to help those researchers meet, have conversations, share their experiences of conducting this sort of research and learn together. Um, and we're also really keen to engage with the participants, so the different citizen scientists that will be on those different projects and find ways that they could also come together. Um, we've also done some reviewing of previous UKRI funded exploration citizen science projects, again looking to share learning, pull out, you know, what can we see across these projects that might tell us something about what citizen science um, has to offer and where maybe it's going. Um, and for me, you know, I've worked on both of these pieces and it's been such a privilege to hear from researchers really the sort of journey that they've been on across this research to hear the kind of nitty gritty of what goes on when you conduct citizen science, um, which I think gives you an insight that's much richer than maybe just a very polished final, um, you know, paper might be. 
Um, so from that work, I'm just going to pick out three different things that I think are quite special and interesting about citizen science. These are not obviously all the things that are interesting about this method. Um, but something that interests me is that, you know, wherever we can point to something that we think is a strength of this methodology, there's always going to be some tension and some challenge and some complexity there. And I think that's such an interesting part of conversation about citizen science, and we should always um, welcome that as well, I think. So firstly, citizen science, I think, is often spoken of as a way for the people, um, members of the public who take part in the research to learn something. So to learn about the science, about the topic of the research. Um, but what's interesting for me is that I think this is really an opportunity for learning to be shared. And I've heard so much across the work I've been doing from researchers about how much they learned from the people they engaged with. So not only are citizen scientists experts in their own context, but also those interactions between a researcher and the citizen scientists can lead to really surprising ideas um, that can then prompt that research to go in a different new interesting direction. But there is a tension here, which is that um, in the research world, there is a level of pre-planning that is um, necessary. And it can be really difficult to be flexible and to adapt to what you're learning from your citizen scientists um, within a sort of quite bureaucratic academic context. So I think that's an interesting tension for us to think about and navigate going forwards with citizen science. Another way that I think citizen science has the potential to be extremely powerful is, um, you know, for the kind of ripple effects that can extend from this project. So earlier it was noted that you could get, you know, huge numbers of people to take part. But in fact, each and every person who takes part might then take what they've learned and what they've experienced in that research um, and from that, you know, change their own life and the people around them. So to give a really brief example, I've spoken to a researcher on an air pollution project who described how one of their citizen scientists said after taking part, they were no longer going to drive their kids to school. They were going to walk because of their experience doing this research. You know, they themselves saw the air pollution as they measured it. Um, and they were also going to speak to other parents at the school gates to uh, try and motivate them to also stop driving so much. So we can see how there's a potential here for that learning from this one project to ripple through that community. But of course, this is an anecdote. We don't know if that person did stop driving. Um, we don't know if maybe they stopped driving for a couple of weeks and then went back to the car. Um, it's really hard to do a follow up to find out you know, to what extent, how far or for how long there have been ripples extending from a given project. And doing that kind of follow up really requires, um, you know, funding and infrastructure that enables that to happen. And I think that's another thing that we should be thinking about for citizen science of the future. And then the last sort of theme, I guess I will highlight about citizen science is um, that it's often, I think, spoken of as a as an approach that also empowers the people who take part. So citizen scientists who undertake these various projects might develop skills and tools that they can then use, you know, to better their communities. Um, and for me also, I think there's an interesting dimension here where, again, it's a two way learning where researchers who work with participants in this way might change the way they do research. Um, and over time, I think citizen science therefore has the power to change the research landscape and to make research agendas more relevant to, to people's everyday lives and their communities. Um, but as a note, I will just say it's interesting to think about, you know, when people design research and apply for funding, to what extent are we considering this empowerment as the central aim? Or to what extent is a sort of nice extra added um, potential benefit? So I think that's something to take forward. And in general, across the work we've been doing with the different research teams and looking at citizen science and looking at where the field is going, I think we're finding more questions than necessarily hard answers. But again, for me, I think that's part of what makes this work so interesting. Um, I have a sense that maybe citizen science might be becoming a little more interdisciplinary. In those videos you saw, there are some that are quite uh, perhaps scientific. Uh, and if we think about that museum example, we might be seeing others that are moving 
in the arts and humanities direction as well. I think that's just something to watch and see where that develops. And then I think there are areas where um, citizen science is a broad church, and I think it should be. And I think it'll be interesting for us to think about how we balance different ways of doing citizen science. As I mentioned with the ripple effects, I think there is a need for longer term sustained approaches, but at the same time, short piloting responsive research is also very important and we need to balance that. And it's really important to also acknowledge that there are very different ways to be a citizen scientist. Being a citizen scientist could mean taking some measurements and then sending those to a researcher. But being a citizen scientist could also mean having in-depth discussions with a researcher about what the research should look like and how it should work. Um, and I think how we accommodate both and how we think about in which situations and for who uh, being a citizen scientist in different ways is most appropriate is really important. And the thought I will just leave you with is that for me, it has been such a privilege to meet so many researchers working on citizen science and to learn about so many different projects. And I think that having conversations that are about the research journey, that acknowledge the challenges and complexities of doing research, you know, in the real world where it is messy, um, those conversations are really powerful. And I think that we can share so much knowledge and using that, we should be able to have influence to you know, promote and improve citizen science approaches in different contexts. Uh, so I look forward to having a Q&A later and thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Hello and good morning everybody and thank you Helena, that was an amazing setup for my talk. So just double checking people can hear me okay? Some thumbs up, brilliant. So yeah. hello everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Christian Reynolds. I'm from the Center for Food Policy and I'm talking today a little bit more specific about citizen science and food. And we heard in some of those earlier videos this morning how food is a perfect um, place for citizen science to engage because everybody eats and everybody has a stake in the food system. So. Um, to, um, as I said, my name is Christian Reynolds. I've worked um, previously in healthy, sustainable diets and food waste, um, both in uh, those different areas and working in the citizen science areas for a while. So I'm originally from Australia and I got into citizens, citizen science during my PhD, um, which was at the University of South Australia. And I was at the Barbara Hardy Institute. And on the desks next to me in the Barbara Hardy Institute was Dr. Philip Ruckman. And he was doing the great koala counts and Operation Magpie and all these other biodiversity style citizen science um, operations where people would go into their backyard with tablets or the starting of smartphones because 2012 remember a decade ago smartphones weren't as ubiquitous um, and actually seeing what was in their natural environment and that led me to understand the potential and the power of citizen science and so then as part of the science and technology facilities council food network plus the stfc food network plus in 2018 to 2020 myself um, and other people on the call today um, got involved with zooniverse which is one of the big long-running citizen science platforms out there for identification and tagging of images to see if we could engage people in counting the calories and in environmental impacts of different food images and that presented some really interesting results then, of course, the pandemic happened, and we've all had changes over that time. But um, what's happened is that we've continued to work in the citizen science area as part of ongoing research. And so there's lots of different uh, things that I'm doing and others are doing, and you've heard many different projects are happening today. And so uh, this is part of thinking about how citizen science could be uh, fed as both food waste or to the wider food system. And so partnering with the FSA, we've produced the citizen science and food review of different um, things that have been happening within the food system. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But before I go to that, I will highlight that over the last year, I've also been continuing to work on citizen science. Firstly, looking, engaging students on campus in terms of providing an app for students on campus, and they helped students design, help design the app, and then analyze some of that data over that time in terms of thinking about working on reduction of food waste, diversion of food waste, and also redistribution and food security all on campus at the University of Sheffield. It only had 894 users, but still, um, a, a, six months after we had a core base of 200 or so students still actually using the app, which I think is a bit of a win for, for a small pilot project. 
The other thing I did was engage with Islington Council and Octopus Communities in doing a um, citizen science of food waste measurement in the community, recruiting different households, working with them to measure their food waste, and then actually trying different strategies out for reducing their food waste, which were then fed back to Islington Council, um, which hopefully in the next year will be then um, broadcast across Islington in terms of ways that they can take strategies in their advertising and things like that. But it was found that through this process, 84% of the households that actually worked with the Citizen Science pro Project, I know it's only 20 households, um, but 84% uh, of them had wasted lower than UK average, which is quite exciting in terms of just showing that small engagements can lead to big things. But again, as the previous, um, as Helena said, we don't know how they've been doing since then, just exactly, exactly as she said in terms of, um, we don't know how long that parent kept driving, walking rather than driving. I don't know how my household's engaged um, if they've continued to waste less food. But we could if we had longer running pits of research out there. So again, we've had many different definitions of citizen science, but to me, it's where public citizens are participating as investigators in that research alongside the wider professional science community, and it's engaging with a many diversity of publics, and it's enabled through our research knowledge. But it's not also about engagement, it's about bringing these fresh perspectives, and that's what makes it really exciting. I said everybody needs to eat and everybody does eat, but we all eat slightly differently, and we all engage with the food system in different ways. And that's what makes citizen science really important to me, because it's getting these different viewpoints into policy and into changes in the food system. And again, there's different, as Helena also rightly said, I'm sorry for the slight slide duplication there, but there's many different levels of citizen science. So it could be, if we think about this, being citizens as sensors, so just recording things, recording koalas, recording uh, magpies out in the real world, or actually interpreting that data, collecting that data, or indeed finding the definitions and the problems. And I think because I'm at the Center for Food Policy, I think about this in terms of thinking about how we can influence policy, thinking about these different forms of engagement in terms of thinking about um, how we can then change policy. And I think this is something that the FSA has been really thinking about over this time, in terms of thinking about how it actually leads to better policy and better food system outcomes. And I think the thing I want to highlight here is there are different costs in terms of monetary costs and time for citizen engagement in terms of defining a research question as opposed to being a data collector, as opposed to analysing that data. And I think that's something that a lot of the different projects that have been funded by the FSA can talk about in their experiences in terms of cost, because I think if we're wanting different voices to be part of this discussion, we also need to think about the equity of those voices and how we actually support those voices in terms of financial recomp recompensation for these. Because indefinitely, in my different experiences, um, different people could not afford to do this in the right way. And some people, if we did have financial compensation in previous projects, were worried about losing, say, their universal credit support if they engage with research. And so we need to have that wider discussion of both getting unheard communities into citizen science, but also making sure they are heard and their voices are heard equitably and equally along with a wider food system community. Because citizen science can also happen in research, but it could also be in terms of policy formation and decision making and implementation and lots of other areas that this could go to. Sorry, I'll get off my high horse there. So we started looking at how food, we mapped back in 2018-19 where food and citizen science can uh, link together. And of course, it can be through citizens, but citizens aren't just eaters, they're also producers of food. So we need to think about farmers, cooks, chefs as being part of the citizen science community. And I know, say, NIAB and other research area centres in the country are already engaging farmers in farm-based citizen science. But there's lots of different areas that we can be examining as food citizen science areas. So I've listed a few on screen here. Um, and again, I'll highlight that Food Standards Agency has really been pioneering here in terms of going from our review in 2021 to now in late 2022, having results from all these amazing pilot projects. So hopefully we can see this as just the start and I'm looking forward to touching base and, um, with the rest of the projects and the uh, breakouts later on today, but hearing about those different um, outcomes and hopefully the FSA and UKRI can continue to join for to bring about more research in this area, hopefully with big, bigger funding pots um, and also with uh, higher levels of recompense, uh, uh, recompense to the citizens involved as well to enable them to be enrolled for longer and in more aspects of the food citizen science journey. 
So I'll just highlight a couple of different um, aspects here from our research in the last two or three minutes of my talk. So I would highlight thinking about how the food system has been so complex and it's entirely changing with all the uncertainty around different um, political journeys that the food system needs monitoring. And so it could be monitoring in terms of ecological monitoring. So this could be looking at soil health. It could be looking at um, different pathogens, as has been shown in some of the examples already shown in the different videos. It could be thinking about how we can grow different food within our communities. So this could be allotments, it could be underground gardening, it could be mushrooms. There are many different things in terms of thinking about how we actually grow food in an urban environment and how that fits into our wider food system. We could also think about engaging artisanal or specialist producers. So this could be um, examples of brewers and bakers um, with a, sli a picture on the slide here is looking at the different microbes um, and fungi within bakers' hands and within their kitchens. And we've also heard about, say, in the lettuce project, um, uh, citizens um, looking and swapping their lettuces there to look at what was there. So actually going to the communities that this matters to and getting them to be part of the food safety um, monitoring and evaluation um, that is done by the FSA. Really exciting. Um, I'll also highlight there could be um, aspects here in terms of thinking about the plant-based proteins. And so there's the Shojin Meat Project in Japan, which I'll go into in the next slide, which is then looking at cellular agriculture, but using it as an education tool for public communication, um, as well as thinking about where we actually get our proteins from. So some amazingly interesting things happening in Japan there. Likewise, it could be, as we've seen in our different projects, looking at food safety and fraud. Um, and again, uh, this has already been highlighted very well by these different um, previous projects that have been talked. And we'll, then the next video will also have these more of these projects. So my final thoughts and my final 30 seconds are that citizen science provides a new entry point for co-creation to the food system for research and policy formation. And it allows a much more diverse set of voices to engage in this policy process and generate evidence that actually helps these voices and amplifies these voices. There is much more monetary and time commitment to the citizen science process above traditional research and policy mechanisms. But to me and my viewpoint, it is very much worth it. So thank you for allowing me to talk today. I'm really excited to talk in the next couple of breakout rooms and hear what everyone else has to say. So thank you. I'm Margaret Gould and I work at the Leiden University in the Netherlands and I'm a coordinator there of the Citizen Science Lab, which is the, a knowledge hub for citizen science, but also a project incubator for citizen science. And we have quite a lot of partnerships, both with fellow researchers, but also with societal actors and bottom up citizen science. And I'd like to give you a little bit of a picture about how all of these things that you're describing are fitting into what we can really see as a, a kind of a global movement towards better embedding citizen science and the angle that I'm seeing it at myself is embedding this quite solidly within the picture of open science and the ethos of open science. So if we look at what's happening at the global level with the, the recommendations on open science from UNESCO, which were, which were approved by the membership body this past, um, actually a year ago now, and there's a, a number of very active working groups with, within UNESCO looking at how to embed these recommendations within policy, within nation states, within legislation at various levels. So there's a lot of work there that's, um, that's happening and the citizen science voice is very much in this. So to zoom in on the definition within the UNESCO recommendations that describes the engagement of societal actors in the production of scientific knowledge, but, but also in appreciating other forms of knowledge, other knowledge systems that are coming from society. So it's not just, here's all our science uh, um, happening and then we share it at the end. And it's not just about to get people to give us our data at the front bit and then we take it back over with our science process, but fully collaborative and also completely led from society and owned by society throughout. So all of these systems are described as being an essential part of open science. Um, and any of you that are interested in engaging at this level with UNESCO, you are very welcome to. Um, the Global Citizen Science Partnership has just finally um, launched its formal legal status, which allows it to engage directly with the UN, which is really quite exciting because it's embedding citizen science practices in understanding how citizen generated data and gathered gather data can, for example, contribute directly to the UN sustainable development goals. And these are some of the supporting partners that are engaged at the moment. 
but there's also a working um, community of practice that's placing citizen science very solidly in this picture about societal engagement as part of open science. And then at the European level, which is the, the main thing I'd like to share with you today, um, um, and yes, we still include you in Europe. We'll keep that painful topic to the side and, and I'd hope that that all changes someday. But what's happening in the European Commission's funding program for research is that citizen science and citizen engagement and engagement of societal actors as participants is woven throughout all of the missions. It's woven throughout all of the cluster focuses. It's woven throughout the European Green Deal. It's woven into the new European Bauhaus vision. So it's really deeply embedded. But the thing that's that's interesting at the that translates then to the national level is that it's a criteria. It's been a criteria that's set for these funding programs. Um, and the main thing I'd like to tell you about is a particular knowledge sharing exercise that's happening right now. It's uh, supported by the, the policy support facility of the European Commission. And there's 11 different member countries that have, have chosen to take part in this. And we're right in the middle of this right, right now. We've got um, five topics that we're looking at throughout the year in a series of, of workshops. So we've so far been looking at an introduction and an overview of citizen science and how to ensure good practices and impacts. Um, we actually had a slight reordering. We've been looking at the enabling environments and next up is where we're looking at maximizing relevance and scaling up citizen science approaches. So these lovely case studies that you're sharing with us today, uh, looking at these opportunities to change, to extend it to another city, a wider region, another country, scale it up across Europe. These, uh, these opportunities to take um, success stories and continue to build on them. And this is the repository where you can find all of the reports that we're working on so far within this mutual learning exercise on all of the topics. It's a mix of discussion papers that are leading into our discussion on these topics and also the topic reports that are coming out after those discussions and sharing as much examples from the, from, from the field as we can. Um, I don't think we'll have very many people in the room with us today that are new, completely new to citizen science, but the first report is a lovely starting point for understanding what citizen science is. Um, and the, the author of this particular report is in the room with us today, Muki Hakla, if you'd like to wave on, in the online chat channel. And, it, and he chose as the lens for this particular report um, this graphic way of understanding the different types and flavors of citizen science projects and how they might look and what they can contribute. So it's another in, in interesting lens on how do you understand this broad typology of different types and flavors and contexts of citizen science. So it's a very useful starting point. Um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to zoom in with you on this particular topic, and this has been my topic within the mutual learning exercise, and that's about enabling environments. And Helena touched on this and the importance of this in her talk, and, and Christian, you also have been touching on it in, in your talk. And I'd, I'd like to look at what we're talking about when we're talking about an enabling environment for these types of initiatives to be able to, um, to start, to be supported, to to achieve their intended impacts, but also them, for them to be sustained over the longer term. So this is an easy way to group the, the, cat, the types of enabling factors that we're talking about into a kind of a category thinking. And you see at the heart of this is funding, dedicated funding. And this is one of the really key pieces that UKRI is bringing into the total ecosystem for citizen science, the dedicated funding lines, also opportunities for ongoing funding to scale up success stories. This is also crucial. And also how funding mechanisms work within each of these any given enabling enabling factors. Now I'll, I'll share these slides with you later so you can read these at leisure because the next few slides are quite text heavy. But I just want to leave for you there for a moment the types of things we're talking about within those categories. So, it, a, a, so a UK science policy statement saying the engagement of citizens in uh, research practices is crucial to reach, to achieve societal impacts so or to address uh, big challenges together. This kind of statement at a national science policy level is one of the keys to making um, the funding instruments possible for also embedding it into other levels of policies, for example, environmental policy. So this is one aspect but also internally within our, inst within our institutions. Um, and I apologize for the, um, 
so the uh, uh, three-letter acronym soup in that text. Um, I'm happy to give you back up um, glossaries to all of this as well. But embedding the support for our researchers within research performing institutes, but also interestingly in other types of science performing institutes. And Christian, I think you raised a really interesting picture here. It's not just uh, the universities and the colleges and the polytechs, it's also um, scientists embedded in other and other policy, uh, other policy bodies, and supporting these types of research practices internally, um, and of course building capacity for that, training, ex exchanging knowledge about about best practices, continuing to innovate and develop best practice, the uh, the support of infrastructures for that, particularly the good handling of data. And a sense of citizen science data stewardship, I think, is really coming in here from the open science practices and, the, and fair data and understanding how to um, open when possible, but not always when it needs to be closed when necessary. This kind of thinking is also being brought into the heart of citizen science practices. And finally, dialogue, the importance of dialogue with both public and private stakeholders. So this whole sense, the quadruple helix, um, even going quintuple helix to include the environment as a, as a stakeholder, as having an amp impact. Um, in the Netherlands, at the national level, this is translating into our science policies. Right now, we're working on the open science policy. It's maybe interesting to mention it to you as you, as you talk about the UK policy and the role that UKRI can play in supporting this enabling environment. Um, for us, it's, uh, it's happening once again in the context of open science strategy and program for the Netherlands. And you can see here atop a line, key line of action within our open science policy. And I'll, ju I'll just zoom into that really quickly. That's towards societal engagement and participation, drawing on that UNESCO level definition. And I'm leading the piece of work in that um, for citizen science, which has brought about the start of our first citizen science national network to connect practitioners um, the UK network is organically quite strong, but this could be a support of a source of real support to really bring people together much more cohesively in shared practice, not only amongst academic and research institutions, but also much more grassroots and the collaborations in the middle, including private public partnerships. Um, and I will continue down into this. One of the keys, and I, I touched on it with looking at how you support citizen science practices within institutes, in the Dutch conversation within the, op the bigger open science strategy, this has been a really key part of the conversation, which is a changing the way that we assess researchers and, the, and the, the quality of their research, the impacts of their research, and how we support careers, um, how we support scientific careers. Let's broaden it beyond just research that the other types of activities that you're doing, team science, collaboration, science communications, public engagement, these all have very high value that needs to be also supported in how you're approaching your career. And this has been, this is part of the puzzle for embedding that inside institutions. And then of course, at the local levels, and, and today we're hearing such amazing examples of, of grassroots movements, collaborative movements between researchers and societal actors. And I'd like to join um, Christian in echoing also the policy impacts aspects of citizen science projects. Just by briefly sharing with you the, our own local example of Plastic Spotter. And it's a really interesting evolutionary story. So it started with a really big open call to all of the residents of Leiden to say what kinds of re science research questions or questions they had that they would like to tackle together. And one of the winning questions was how much plastic litter is there in our canal ways? We have the second most number of uh, canals throughout the city after Amsterdam. So it's a very uh, urban waterway oriented city, but we're also close to the coast. So in terms of starting point of plastic pollutions entering our, 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 our oceans, we're at, the, we're at the top of this chain. Um, and at first it was a mobile app where people could report it. But very quickly, the people participating were frustrated because they also wanted to take it out of the water and they wanted to tackle it at source. So this project evolved into a much more activist and client activity in, canoe, in, 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 in canoes, where every single weekend for almost three years now, a core group of maybe about 20 volunteers have been, have been consistently going almost every week 
in total, there have been close to a thousand people participating as a fun activity on the weekend or as a team away day to actively take the plastics out, assess them, and most importantly, share the report with the local municipality to tackle this at source. Um, and the storytelling is coming out of these participants that are very active. And this is our local, um, our local municip municipal, um, I can't think of the English term, vet holder, uh, the lady in charge of, of cafes, restaurants, um, and, the, and the wider environment in the city, receiving a report about how much of this waste is coming from all of these lovely cafes and terrace tables that are alongside the canals. And what's interesting about what's in this report is when you find a menu or you find little uh, sugar uh, sachets and things of this nature, not only do you know where you found it, do you know where it started? So all of a sudden we have really quite an interesting story to tell about how plastic litter is, is ending up in the waterways. So I wanna leave you with that, that sense of also the immediate policy impacts and other types of motivations of the volunteer participants play a really big role here. Um, and that's a, a, a whirlwind tour of all these levels of things that are happening that what you yourselves are doing are very much part of. I suppose since I'm the one who uh, raised the ripples, I can, I can start us off maybe. Um, I think what's come through to me certainly in the work we did reviewing in UKRI funded projects and the work we're doing collaborating with them is that I think there's an appetite among researchers to, to do that kind of work um, and to do that kind of work collaboratively with the participants who took part. I think often we hear a sort of perhaps a level of sadness from both sides that the projects come to an end and both the participants and the researchers um, have to say goodbye to, to that work that they've done. Um, but in terms of, you know, placing a kind of responsibility, well, there has to be funding, of course, in place to do that work. Um, it, it's unrealistic to expect it to be done for free, um, both for the researchers, but also for the people taking part who are giving up, you know, time and energy. Um, so I think there's an element where um, there's a kind of infrastructural need to build funding to to make it possible for that long term work to take place. Um, Thanks, Helena. Margaret, do you want to come in? Yeah, I wanted to add something, uh, an additional layer to that. One of the exercises that we did with this uh, group of 11 member states engaging in the mutual le learning exercise with us when we talked about the enabling factors is we did a, a little exercise in spheres of influence where we looked at in your own institution or in your own roles or the things that you have a mandate to do, which, of, which enabling factors can you either help put in place or influence to be put in place. And then we went a layer under that to say, and what enabling factors do you need to be able to do that? And looking at all of these different roles within the science landscape or within the research and policy landscape to see where these different types of roles can be picked up to be part of putting these enabling factors in place. And I think that's part of the layering that's, that's needed here. Kristen, did you want to add anything on that? I am conscious I'm speaking while there's lots of UKRI people in the room. And I guess it's just saying that maybe for citizen science projects, we need an extra slot in our discussion to say, we need a monitoring and evaluation slot that tails, and we need to have a, a funding stream that can go for longer, which may not fit with UKRI three to five year contracts or saying the main project can only be two to three two to three years, but you, you are allowed to have an extra two to three years of evaluation post there. And I think that's, you know, in, in words what Margaret's been saying as well. So I don't, yeah, I'm just aware this may be something we all need to discuss further is how you actually work these successfully to enable that longer relationship. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, we are speaking on behalf of UKRI. We're very happy to, for people to give feedback on, you know, on, on kind of funding structures and at this event.
I guess reflecting again, I'm going to be talking mainly food centric because that's my area. But I think there are different levels of time scale that can happen in terms of in from our review, there were citizen science projects that were looking at food safety, for instance. And if there was unsafe food or pathogens found, there are processes that could get things done very, very quickly in terms of uh, within most food safety regulations to show there will be change. Likewise, in terms of many of the uh, projects around say local government change or, or get, gathering data for local governments uh, to change things in their natural environment, that is a local government timescale. So being open with people about their change or how long it takes. Um, likewise, if you're thinking say Zooniverse and planet spotting, if you even identify uh, a, a planet on that, it could be three to four years maybe five, maybe never, that it actually gets confirmed, published, and you've actually named a planet and it gets written up in the paper. Holy cow, that's amazing when it does happen. But these are um, different timescales. And I think it's just being open to people when they engage as to what the timescales might be. Thanks, Christian. Helena? Yeah, I think also, you know, I'd point back to the, what I said briefly in the presentation about there are different ways to be a citizen scientist. And I think that some ways of being a citizen scientist might um, make this a little easier. So if you're having direct conversations with, with your participants, with your citizen scientists, I think this should be part of that conversation um, that can be discussed quite openly. And I've also seen some brilliant examples where the citizen scientists or the people taking part were involved in planning and designing how to make sure that they have impact, be that, you know, identifying a way of getting their local community to speak to their local MP based on the, the citizen science project they did or, or suggesting who to reach out to and who to send the reports to. Um, so I think if you are doing that level of engagement and you're directly conversing with your participants, they can be part of the, the expectation setting activity too. Of course, if they are just, um, let's say, submitting some data, then I think it's going to have to be just very clear communication um, going one way, which I think is, is harder for this particular issue. Thanks, Margaret. Did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I think, I th I think there's a few things that I would echo. Um, First of all, what, what Helena was just saying, it's really, it's it's kind of an argument for the value of collaborative citizen science, much more collaborative right from the beginning where you have that conversation together. What do you want to get out of this? What is your need? What objective are you hoping to reach? And this is the kind of evolution story, story you saw in the Plastic Spotter project. Um, it's also an understanding of the time scales. Helena earlier pointed out that not all impacts can be measured within the time period that you're looking at. They can play out much, much further. Um, and in fact, it came out in some of the um, it came up in some of the videos as well that, that these these can play out um, over a longer period of time. So you need this ongoing community activity. Um, but the other argument I would make is that the, the intrinsic motivations of people who participate are, are, are very much present. And it's much more about our effort made to find them where people are already engaged with these topics, talking about them, looking for a path to act on them um, and not. Um, not having the lens of how can I get people to give me my data. I think this is the risk as a research there, that you don't have this viewpoint on it, but you find the people that are already curious or fascinated about this topic or care about this topic or impacted by this topic. And there's your intrinsic participation group. I think there's quite strong awareness and growing awareness across domains of research of exactly um, the, challenge, the challenges there. So I think there's quite a few projects that have reflected back and seen that they are reaching those who are already interested in science, those who already have strong science capital. Depending on the nature of the research, you have really typical profiles of middle-aged white males that are tech, uh, tech savvy or um, highly educated females recently retired with time on their hands and love nature. You get these really quite classical profiles that lean towards the already reached, already it already um, benefiting from what science has to bring society. So the active task on the side of the project initiator or the researcher to reach, to, to go out to communities that are underreached, not the hard to reach. It just means more work for us because we have to think about it, but the, the, the effort to go out and engage with them. Um, and the quicker that's a partnership and a genuine collaborative conversation, the better, because then you really have people thinking with you 
with their communities. And then you have the chance to reach the community leaders that will help you engage with people that you otherwise might not be able to get in contact with. Christian? Uh, okay. Um, uh, so I think exactly everything that Margaret just said, and I think in, in definitely in terms of food citizen science, I think there are many niche avenues as well, and the people who engage will engage on specific topics. But I think this goes back to the high horse I was on in terms of there are groups who cannot afford to engage currently, and we can enable them to engage by making payments to that. And in our review, we found some of the most effective ways to reach minority groups are to provide, say, creche facilities so that mothers can actually engage. It's to provide um, food at events so that way people don't have to get lunch. You know, there are things that may not be just payments, but wider lifestyle things that enable wider demographics to actually in, engage in different ways within this. Um, and I think that's uh, us as researchers and policymakers have to, if we want to have more voices here, we need to have a, a more funding for uh, these, will allow these wider voices into it. And it helps because you then actually get the, this evidence through to the policy process. Thank you, Christian. Helena, do you want to finish off? So just as a small thought, I would also say as much as I've been maybe advocating for more engagement or more involvement of participants in decision making, um, I think this is where we also need to acknowledge that not everyone wants to take part in the biggest, most involved way. Um, and this is where I think, you know, saying citizen science is a broad church and there are different ways to be a citizen scientist. Um, you know, we should be looking to preserve that and thinking about in which situations and for who is what style or, or type of involvement most suitable, um, rather than maybe assuming that, you know, everyone just wants to be a co-researcher at all times. Fantastic. And thank you so much again to all of our panel. 